hi guys it's me professor d and welcome back to my channel on this video i'm going to be covering the care of the postpartum patient if you haven't done so already guys please be sure to like and subscribe below and without any further ado guys let's get started first question a 25 year old gravity 2 para 2002 gave birth four hours ago to a nine pound seven ounce boy after augmentation of labor with pitocin she puts on her call light and asks for her nurse right away, stating, I'm bleeding a lot. The most likely cause of afterbirth hemorrhage in this woman is A, retained placental fragments, B, unrepaired vaginal lacerations, C, uterine acne, or D, pearl infection. And I'll give you guys a moment to think of your answer. If you're new to my channel, all you have to do is press the pause button, take some time to formulate your answer. Whenever you're ready, press play and we will continue. All right, guys, so the correct answer is C, uterine acne. This is the most likely cause when a woman is bleeding. We suspect a uterine acne. And what is the first thing you're gonna do? You suspect uterine acne, you're gonna what? Massage the fundus, okay? Because when you massage the fundus, that causes contractions. Contractions causes constrictions. Constriction stops what? Bleeding. It keeps the patient from hemorrhaging to death, all right? So um, going back to that, the number one cause postpartum when a woman is bleeding, it's because of uterine acne. It's, that fundus is boggy, okay? It's soft and we need it to be firm. We need it to contract. So what you're gonna do is massage the fundus, okay? And that will cause a contraction, will, which will help decrease the bleeding. All right, next question. On examining a woman who gave birth five hours ago, the nurse finds that the woman has completely saturated a perineal pad within 15 minutes. The nurse's first action is to A, begin an IV infusion of a ringer's lactate solution, B, assess the woman's vital signs, C, call the woman's primary health care provider, or D, massage the woman's fundus. All right, guys, and the correct answer is D, massage the woman's fundus. Did I not just tell you after a woman gives birth and she is bleeding, you ought to sus suspect uterine acne. And what do you do when you suspect uterine acne? You massage the fundus. I just told you that. So if you picked another answer, why would you do that? I just told you what the answer was. You're going to massage the fundus. You're going to keep that patient from bleeding out. Now, let me tell you how they tried to trick you. If you look at, let's go through all the wrong answers. Let's just go through them. You have A, begin, begin an IV infusion of lactate ringers. What is that going to do for the patient? That patient's still bleeding out. That's wrong. You're not going to do that. You may do that later. After you massage the fundus, right? It's not becoming firm. The bleeding has to stop. The patient's still bleeding. You need to replace those fluids. Yes, lactate ringers, that's wonderful. Dehydration, that's wonderful for a patient that's um, losing blood. But that's not the first thing you're going to do. You're going to do what? Massage the fundus, okay? Let's keep it moving. Second one, assess vital signs. Let me tell you, they tried to trick you, trick you with that. Why? Because we know the first thing you always want to do for a patient is assess, assess, assess. But guys, it has to make sense to you. That's critical thinking. They gave you enough information in the question that the assessment's over. You've already assessed it. Look what they told you in the question. They told you that the patient gave birth five hours ago and their pad is completely saturated in 15 minutes. So when you do an assessment on that patient, what is that assessment gonna tell you that's gonna change your intervention? Because on the information that they've given us, we can tell that this patient's hemorrhaging to death. So you're gonna take the blood pressure just for the blood pressure to tell you that the blood pressure is going down? Uh, duh, they're bleeding. So what, you're gonna take the heart rate just for the heart rate to tell you that it's up? Well, duh, they're bleeding. What are you, wh why are you taking the vitals? What is that gonna do for you and how's that gonna change your intervention? It has to make sense, okay? So in this question, we've already got our assessment, okay? It's time to intervene. Let's see what our last choice was. Call the woman's doctor. Really? So while our patient is bleeding to death, you're calling the doctor to do what? Let the doctor know that your patient's bleeding to death? No. The first thing you're going to do is massage the 
fundus, you want to stop, you want to control that bleeding. That is the very first thing to do. Yes, you may have to call the doctor later, but that's after you've done your nursing interventions that you're autonomous with that you don't need a doctor's order for, which massaging the fundus is one of them. All right, guys, let's move on to the next question. A woman gave birth vaginally to a nine pound, 12 ounce uh, girl yesterday. Her primary health care provider has written orders for perennial ice packs, use of a sitz bath three times a day, and a stool softener. What information is most closely related to these orders? A, the woman is a gravita 2, para 2. B, the woman had a vacuum-assisted birth. C, the woman received epidural anesthesia. Or D, the woman has had an episiotomy. And I'll give you guys a moment to think of your answer. Okay, guys, and the correct answer is D, the woman who's had an episiotomy. So the woman's had a natural birth and she may have had, she may have had some perennial tearing and the doctor, you know, has had to maybe go in there and stitch her up. So these types of orders, let me go back to the question. When you see that the doctor's ordering ice packs, what does cold do? Cause constriction, right? Decreases that swelling that's happening down there. Sits bath, that's soothing to the patient, decrease the pain. And of course, stool softener. Why stool softener? Because we do not want that patient bearing down. We don't want them doing the salva maneuver. We don't want them going like this mm, and causing increased pressure to the perennial area that the doctor just sewed up. No, we don't want to do that. So those types of orders we see in the patients who had episiotomies or who's had um, hemorrhoids, Okay. So D is the correct answer. Next question. A woman gave birth 48 hours ago to a healthy infant girl. She's decided to bottle feed. Bottle feed. During your assessment, you notice that both of her breasts are swollen, warm, and tender on palpation. The woman should be advised that this condition can best be treated by A, running warm water on her breast during a shower, B, applying ice to the breast for comfort, C, expressing small amounts of milk from the breast to relieve pressure, or D, wearing a loose fitting bra to prevent nipple irritation. And I'll give you guys a second to think of your answer. I'm very annoyed with myself because I forgot to make another cup of coffee before I started this video. All right, guys, so the correct answer is B, applying ice to the breast for, camp, uh, for comfort. Well, what did I just tell you about ice? Didn't I tell you ice and cold causes what? Constriction. And that's what we want because what we're seeing in this question with the mom, here's the hints that they gave us. Number one, the mom's bottle feeding. So what does that tell us? She's not getting rid of that milk that's in her breast. Her breasts are now swollen, warm, tender on palpation. What are we suspecting? We're suspecting, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Engorgement. We're suspecting breast engorgement, okay? So you're not gonna do a run, run warm water. Well, guys, what did I tell you about, well, heat? I talked to you guys about heat before. What does heat do? Heat dilates. Now, do we want those vessels in the breast to dilate to cause further engorgement? No, we don't. Because remember, she's not getting rid of her breast milk. She's bottle feeding. Matter of fact, them telling you that mom's bottle feeding, that was your first sign, that was your first clue to know that where they were heading with this question. Okay? So we don't want to put warmth to the breast because that's going to cause further engorgement. Choice C, expressing small amounts of milk from the breast to relieve pressure. Absolutely not. Let me explain to you what that does. Every time mom expresses uh, milk from that breast, she produces even more milk, okay? So that's gonna make the engorgement even worse. So you do not want to teach that to mom either. That's wrong. And then of course, course choice D, wear a loose fitting bra to prevent nipple irritation. No, mom needs to be wearing a well-fitted bra. Okay, because a loose fitting bra, what happens is that friction of the bra against the nipple, that's going to cause even more irritation. So the correct answer is ice. Ice will cause constriction of the vessels, which will decrease the engorgement, of course, the discomfort that mom is feeling. By the way, besides ice, another 
thing that you can teach mom to use, and I see this on test questions all the time, are cabbage leaves. And I don't know the science behind it. I keep saying to myself, I'm gonna look it up one day and I just never have the time, I don't do it. So if one of you guys know the science behind it, please leave it down in the comments. I'd love to know, I'll share with the, with the rest of you guys. But for some reason, cabbage also the cabbage leaves also help decrease engorgement in the breast so you can teach mom to wear cabbage leaves over her breast as well but under no circumstances if she plans to bottle feed do not express any milk from the breast because she's only going to produce even more do not put warmth on the breast because it's going to cause dilation which will cause further um, engorgement and of course no loose fitting bras we want the bra to fit very well all right, next question. A afterbirth woman overhears the nurse tell the OB clinician that she has a positive Holman sign and asks what it means. The nurse's best response is A, you have pitting edema in your ankles. B, you have deep tendon reflexes rated two plus. C, you have calf pain when the nurse flexes your foot. Or D, you have a fleshy odor to your vaginal drainage. Okay, guys, the correct answer is C, you have calf pain when the nurse flexes your foot. And when the nurse flexes the patient's foot and they have that calf pain, that's a positive home and sign. And what that indicates is that patient may possibly have a DVT. Now, I'm about to age myself, but, you know, 10 years ago, positive home and sign, oh my gosh, DVT, DVT, DVT. We've learned not so much anymore. But many patients that do have positive home and sign they do have a DVT. So if a patient has a positive Holman sign, you do have to let the physician know so they can do further testing. But it doesn't mean automatically just because they have a positive Holman sign that they definitely have a DVT. It just means that they need to be assessed further for the possibility of a DVT. Okay, next question. Excessive blood loss after childbirth can have several causes. The most common cause is A, vaginal or vulvar hematomas, B, unrepaired lacerations of the vagina or cervix, C, failure of the uterine muscle to contract firmly, or D, retained placental fragments. If any of you guys get this wrong, we're going to have a problem. We're going to have a big problem. So I know you guys all got the correct answer and it's C, failure of the uterine muscle to contract firmly. That is the number one cause of bleeding in the postpartum patient, that boggy uterus. So you want to do what? Massage the fundus, okay? We want to cause co uh, muscle contractions to decrease that bleeding. And one other thing I want to bring to your attention, guys, having a full bladder, um, excuse me, can also cause um, the mom to hemorrhage. And let me explain that to you. What happens is if the mom's bladder is full, that fundus will not, the uterine will not contract the way it should. And so it's going to be boggy. And if it's not contracting, patient's going to do what? Bleed. So yes, it's very important. Make sure you massage the fundus, but also check the bladder because it could be something as simple as that patient having a full bladder, which is causing the uterus to not contract the way that it should. Okay. All right. Next question. Oh, <laughs> I think I just gave you the answer to your next question. All right. Because a full bladder prevents the uterus from contracting normally, nurses intervene to help the woman empty her bladder spontaneously as soon as possible. If all else fails, the last thing the nurse should try is A, pouring water from a squeeze bottle over the woman's perineum, B, placing oil of peppermint in a bedpan under the woman, C, asking the doctor to prescribe analgesics, or D, inserting a sterile catheter. Boy, I wish I had my coffee right now. All right, guys, the correct answer is D, inserting um, a sterile catheter. If you've been following my videos for any amount of time now, you know one of the biggest rules I tell you is we always go from least invasive to most invasive. We don't ever want to introduce anything foreign into the body unless we have to, especially after a major trauma to the body, such as surgery or giving birth. 
right? Because putting in that catheter, we might be introducing pathogens. And before you know it, you gave the patient a septic infection, right? So that's what we're going to try last. We are going to try every single non-invasive procedure imaginable before we put in the catheter, okay? We always put in the catheter last after we have no more options and we always take out the catheter as soon as possible. So let's look at the wrong answer choices, guys. Uh, a, pouring water uh, from a squeeze bottle over the woman's perineum. That's actually one of the first things you're gonna be doing. It's non-invasive, why not? That's wonderful. So that's not the answer. B, <coughs> excuse me, placing peppermint Placing all the peppermint in a bedpan under the woman. What happens is the vapors from that peppermint can help relax the muscles, relax the bladder muscles, and help the woman to urinate, okay? That's non-invasive. That's wonderful. We're not going to save that for last, so that's not the answer. Choice C, asking the doctor to prescribe analgesics. Let me explain to you why we ask the doctor to prescribe analgesics. Mom just gave birth, Okay? Now, imagine a bowling ball coming out of your body. Don't you think that's going to be painful? So mom may be afraid to urinate. She may be scared because of the pain. And so her, her um, bladder sphincter is tight like this. So an analgesic will help relax mom, decrease the pain so that those sphincters can open up and the urine can flow freely. All right. So A, B, and C, non-invasive, we're going to go with those first. But choice D, we're going to save that for last after we've exhausted all other options. If a woman is at risk for thrombus and is not ready to ambulate, nurses may intervene by performing a number of interventions. Which intervention should the nurse avoid? A, putting the patient in TED holes or SCD, SCD boots. B, having the patient flex, extend, and rotate her feet, ankles, and legs. C, having the patient sit up in a chair. Or D, notifying the doctor immediately if a positive home and sign occurs. Okay, guys, don't forget, whenever you get a question to ask you which one are you going to avoid, what they're really asking you is, which one are you not going to do? Which one is the wrong answer choice? Okay, so we have three right answer choices and one wrong. And the one that's wrong here is having them sit up in the chair. Why? We don't want the pressure of that back of the chair, what, behind their knees that may cause what? DVT. That's what we're trying to avoid from happening, okay? That's number one. Number two, they're sitting up in the chair. Are they moving? Is there any form of exercise to try to help increase circulation? No. And guess what? When blood doesn't move, what does it do? Pull. When it, when it pulls, what does it do? Clot. Yeah. So that's why we want to do exercises to get the circulation to keep going. Okay, so yes, yeah, she's not ready to walk yet, but we can still do exercises or we can still do things for her to keep that circulation going so the blood doesn't just sit there, pull, and start to clot. Now let's look at our other choices, which are wonderful. We want to do that for the patient. We don't want to avoid them. So let's look at our choices. A, the TED holes and the SCD boots. Those are wonderful. Those will help prevent DVTs. So we're not going to avoid that. Choice B, having the patient flex, extend, rotate feet and ankles. Those are wonderful exercises to be in, to do for the patient in bed. Have the patient do it if they can't do it on their own in bed to prevent DVTs. And then, of course, D, you know if a patient's home and sign is positive, you're going to notify the doctor so further testing can be done. So the correct answer for this question of what we're going to avoid is having that patient sit in a chair. All right, next question. Discharge instruction or teaching the woman what needs to be, I'm sorry guys, let me go back. Discharge instruction or teaching the woman what she needs to know to care for herself and her newborn officially begins, A, at the time of admission to the nurse's unit, B, when the infant is preserved to the mother at, when the infant is presented to the mother at birth, C, during the first visit with the physician in the unit, or D, when the take-home information packet is given to the couple. And guys, the correct answer is A, at the time admission to the nurse's unit, at the time of admission to the nurse's unit. So guys, you learned this back in 
fundies, fundamentals of nursing, nursing process what? Nursing process one, right? Discharge teaching starts when? Admission. The moment that patient is admitted, you start preparing them for discharge. You start teaching them what to expect when they go home. You start teaching them what they need to do when they go home in order not to be readmitted back to the hospital. Discharge teaching begins at admission. Okay? Next question. Postpartal overdistension of the bladder and urinary retention can lead to which complications? A, afterbirth hemorrhage and eclampsia. B, fever and increased blood pressure. C, afterbirth hemorrhage and U UTI. Or D, UTI and uterine rupture. Okay, guys, if you chose C, you got the correct answer, afterbirth hemorrhage and UTI. Remember, what do we know about um, a distended bladder? If the bladder is full, that uterine is not going to uterus is not going to contract the way it should, and it's going to be boggy, which can cause what? Hemorrhage. That's number one. But what else can a full bladder do in this type of patient? If the bladder is full, that means the urine is just sitting there. If the urine is just sitting there, that means the urine is not moving. If urine is not moving, what collects? Bacteria. Yeah, right? So not only can a full bladder cause the mom to have a boggy fundus, cause bleeding, it can also cause her to have a UTI. So it's very important immediately after she gives birth to get her to urinate as soon as possible. All right, next question. RH immune globin will be ordered after birth if which situation occurs? A, mother's RH negative, baby's RH positive. B, mother's RH negative, baby's RH negative. C, mother's RH positive, baby's RH positive, or D, mother's RH positive, baby RH negative. And I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, guys, the correct answer is A, mother's RH negative and baby's RH positive. So let me explain this to you guys because as students, you tend to get this confused so much. So I'm going to try my best just to um, explain it in just very simple terms. The only time mom is going to need that Rogam is if she's negative. If mom is positive, she's good. She's absolutely good. But if mom is negative, let's say mom's negative, right? Then she conceives with dad that's positive. Now that baby's positive. Here's what happens. On her very first pregnancy, nothing. That baby's gonna be just fine. But after she, that first pregnancy, after she has that first child, or maybe she didn't have the child, maybe it was a miscarriage, maybe she had an abortion, whatever. But after that first pregnancy of her being negative and that fetus that's in her womb is positive, her body develops antibodies. <coughs> Excuse me. And so she's got these antibodies floating around in her system, just waiting for another positive fetus to come around here. What happens? She gets pregnant with another positive fetus. Remember, mom's negative, right? But she's got these antibodies now. Her body literally attacks the fetus. It sees the fetus as a foreign invader and it attacks the fetus. Okay. Now let me explain to you why we take precautions. If mom is negative, because remember we only give it if mom's negative, right? If mom is negative and the husband is negative, right? Why do we test baby? Because we don't know if mom had an affair. We don't know if when we were asking mom questions during the um, pre-admission stage and we asked her, have you ever had a miscarriage? Have you ever had abortion? Maybe she did have one of those and she didn't want her husband to know. So she said no. And that miscarriage or that abortion happened to be a positive baby, which made her have antibodies ready to attack, right? Or think about this. <coughs> Excuse me, guys. This is what happens when I don't drink my coffee. I'm ready to die. Think about this. What if she was pregnant and didn't even know? 
She had a miscarriage, but she thought she just happened to have a very heavy menstrual flow that month. And when she was pregnant, <coughs> excuse me, guys. When she was pregnant, even though she's negative, she was pregnant with a positive fetus that caused her to get antibodies in her body. And the next time she meets a man of her dreams, they get married, they have a child, and that child is negative, she's negative, excuse me, that child is positive, she's negative, her body will try to attack it because of the antibodies. So I said all of this just to say, number one, we don't give the Rogam unless mom is negative and the baby's positive. Let's say mom's negative and we don't know what the baby is. Are we going to give Rogam? Yes, we are. We're not taking any chances. But in today's technology, we test all the time. So we know, we test. But let's say you get a question where you have no idea if the baby's negative or positive, but you know for sure mom is negative, you're going to give the Rogam. Okay, but in the perfect world where we know what mom is and we know what baby is, you're going to give the Rogam if mom is a negative and the baby's positive. Okay, I hope I explained that. So here's our other choices. B is wrong because even though mom is RH negative, remember I told you, yes, if mom's RH negative, but look, the baby's RH negative as well. So no need to give Rogam. And of course, C and D, you know it's wrong just by seeing that the mom was positive. Mom's positive, there's no problem. The only time there is a problem is when mom is negative and the baby is positive. Okay, guys, I hope I cleared that up. I don't ever want to see you get a question like this wrong again. Because trust me, when it comes to um, OB, you'll get at least one question like this. Okay, which nursing action is most appropriate to correct a boggy? If any of you guys get this wrong, I'm going to strangle you. I will strangle you. Which nursing action is most appropriate to correct a boggy uterus that is displaced above and to the right of the umbilicus? A, notify the doctor of impending hemorrhage. B, assess the blood pressure and pulse. C, evaluate the lochia. Or D, assist the patient in emptying the bladder. You know it's assist the patient emptying the bladder. How many times did I tell you this? You know that's the answer. I'm not even going to give you a speech. We're going to move on. Next question. When caring for a newly delivered woman, the nurse is aware that the best measure to prevent abdominal distension after a C-section is to A, um, give rectal suppositories, B, early and frequent ambulation, C, tightening and relaxing of abdominal muscles, or D, carbonated beverages. And the correct answer is A, early and frequent ambulation. Early and frequent ambulation is wonderful. And for this particular question, they're asking us about the stension. And the reason that we want to get them ambulating early is because it moves the gas around. Okay? So mom is walking. And while she's walking, you want to know what she's doing? She's farting. She's passing gas. And that's what helps um, avoid that distension. We don't want mom to have distension, but that early ambulation also does something else that is wonderful that we want. And that is to prevent DVTs, to prevent clots. We don't want the patient to develop a clot before you know it, it floats to the lungs and now the patient has a pulmonary embolism, right? So it serves many purposes. It keeps the patients from getting you know, when you keep a patient moving around, you keep them from getting pneumonia, keep them from getting infection. So we definitely want that patient ambulating as soon as possible. How am I already almost out of time? All right, guys. Looks like this is our last question, but I promise I have more coming. All right, guys, last question. The nurse is caring for the afterbirth woman. The nurse caring for the afterbirth woman understands that breast engorgement is caused by A, overproduction of colostrum, B, accumulation of milk in the luciferous duct and glands, C, hyperplasia of mammary glands, or D, congest congestion of veins and lymphatics. 
And guys, I know you know the answer is decongestion of veins and lymphatics. And all of that brings us back to what I was telling you at the beginning of the video. That's the whole reason why we stay away from warmth because warmth will what? Dilate those vessels and cause um, um, more congestion. And cold does what? Constrict and it decreases that congestion. So guys, I hope you found this video to be helpful. Um, if you have, please don't forget to share with your classmates, share with any friends or family you know that's in nursing school right now or studying for their boards. And of course, do not forget to like and subscribe and I'll see you on the next video.